Hey, we are <laughs> recording. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, Skimillet? I am doing well. The first question I want to ask is, why the shark? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right on. So kind of two parts there. Uh, the specific image I thought was very... I thought it embodied the stereotype of an ENTJ. I know just full of teeth, he's carrying the money, he's got the pinstripe suit, all of that, you know? Hmm. Uh, additionally, um, uh, I've, I've got a background a bit in sales, and our company phone is an iPhone, and rather than creating my own Bitmoji profile to react to stuff with when we're doing like a group text, Mm-hmm. I just used the shark one because I'm lazy and I thought it was funny. I got you. I got you. Would you say ENTJs are as yeah. close to the stereotype as they seem or people think? I think they can be. How do you And mean? what I mean by – yeah, so what I mean by that, uh, first off, it depends on the specific ENTJ. Additionally, I think it depends on the context in which you and the ENTJ are, re- are interacting. Mm. So, for example, if you and I were in negotiations, I would be every, and let, let's say we're on opposite sides of the table, although I don't view you as my opposition per se, I would embody every bit of that. Mm. Ruthless is people seem to think we are. That would be how it approached the situation. Vice versa, if you're sitting at the table next to me, you wouldn't know that side of me at all. I'd seem very friendly to you. Yeah, and that was going to be my next question was how how easily or how separated are your ruthless business identity and your other identities? Can you slip in and out of them easily? The reason I ask is with INTPs, it's not as easy to slip. I can't in. hear you right there, Skimlet. I think one of us may have cut out. Um. Okay. Hold on. Let me. Can you hear me now? Yep. Tech. Okay. So one of the. Uh... Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Awesome. So what I was asking was, how separate are those identities, and can you slip in between them easily? Very easily. I find that the... I almost don't even view them as different identities. It's it's more like I'm changing clothes, if that makes sense. And you don't feel attached. To and them. I can very... Not not too attached, no. They're, they're all... They're all... Uh, they're all parts of my whole, if that makes sense. Hmm. But I will bring out specific attributes of myself in different amounts in different situations Hmm. so on the one hand that's definitely no it's part of me but i'm not too attached to that specific part that i need to wear it every minute of every day if that makes sense yes so i can be extremely ruthless one minute and then switch it off and be warm and loving with someone the next that's fascinating. INTPs are not like that in the sense they can't change <laughs> their identities that quickly. Although we do change rather often, it's not it's not like changing clothes. Let me let me swap my Wi-Fi. Let's see. There we go. All right, stabler connection. That way there's no risk of dropping out. Next question. For, for myself, mm-hmm. um, sorry, I'm going to take this on a bit of a quick tangent. For myself, um, I went from high school, I went into the Marine Corps, and then after the Marine Corps, I went into banking. Mm. Now, if I wear boots, like a combat boot, mm-hmm. subconsciously that will bring out certain parts of myself that are very much, you know, that jarhead. Conversely, if I wear a shirt and tie, I'll bring out that customer service banker feel toward people. And that is something you choose to do or something that happens? 
it's something that I noticed happens a bit organically, but I observed that happening organically and I just doubled down on it and I made it more of a habit. Uh, case in point, during that transition period, when I went into banking, I would still cuss sometimes. I didn't even realize, like, what damn is a cuss word? What are you talking about? Mm. So effectively, I tried to figure out, okay, I'm going to embody my concept of a banker. Like, what is the best version of me to fit this role? Mm. And when I put on a shirt and tie, I for, I basically adjust my levels. I flip that switch to fit that role in that moment. That's interesting. So you model yourself after the sort of person you aim to be using not just behavior, but clothes. That's interesting. One question about that would be, do you have a general model for the sort of people you want to become? Or are there specific examples you model yourself after? What I try to do is... So for, for starters, and I, I think this gets into a, a problem that ENTJs may face, right? Mm. It, it's almost like um, going back to that clothes analogy. Mm. Certain types of clothes just don't fit well, or they feel very alien to you to wear. Mm. So what I'll do is I'll try to look at the traits of people occupying a role. And if I can align myself with those traits and have it still fit well, so to speak, mm. I imagine myself basically becoming very much like those people. What are the strengths, similarities, differences between them? Even the flaws, even the areas of me that will um, uh, not overlap very well with that. And I, I basically cast myself into that role and then I try to become it. Do you have Con a... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Conversely, there may be certain things that won't, for lack of a better word, fit me very well at all. Uh, although I did it, customer service wasn't really one of them. I was very, very uncomfortable doing that. I did it very well, but it was it was agony for me. What about it was agonizing? That was going to be another question. How do you model, or how do you use this modeling system in roles mm -hmm. you don't want to be in or dislike? And how do you, how does that affect you? Yeah. So this was this was a pretty difficult time period of my life. And what didn't fit me for customer service was the mindset that the customer is always right and that I'm always there to serve them. Hmm. I can be a pretty disagreeable and I enjoy, I enjoy conflict. Hmm. So at the same time with that, if I constantly have to be trying to cater to this individual who I'm, I'm looking at them I'm like, okay, you're, you're being ridiculous or you're a child having to constantly, uh, cater to their needs, cater to their whims, did not suit me at all. Mm. I wanted to be very brutal and honest with them of like, okay, look, you're, you're being a child in this situation, pull yourself together or I won't help you. I can help you or I can leave you standing high and dry. Which do you want? And then to move from there. Mm. And the, the effect that that had on me, I dreaded dreaded going to work just more and more hmm. and um, imagine the dumb um, um, imagine that you are like something akin to a generator like a nuclear reactor you've got a certain amount of fuel that gets brought into you at any given point in time from different sources and being stuck in a role that for an extended period of time like I I can do it moment to moment for an hour here, an hour there, no problem. But if I'm living that day in, day out, it's just going to drain all the energy out of me. And then there's nothing left for anything else. And all you can think about is escaping. So over time, that role will even start to break down. You'll notice behavioral issues will pop up with an ENTJ doing that. Hmm. And 
while you're in those moments for a long time, do you ever feel inclined to lie to yourself to try to make yourself like it? I I used to. I used to. I I did in that situation and other areas of my life and my mental health started to break down and deteriorate from it. Eventually, you have to have that moment where you're honest with yourself. I'll, this is probably one of the biggest pieces of advice I would have for any other ENTJ out there trying to build and develop yourself. The last person you should ever lie to is yourself. Be honest with yourself and say, okay, you know what? I hate this right now, but I have to get it done. So... I'm going to find some way to try and enjoy it while I can, but I, I recognize that I need to get out of this situation as soon as possible. Mm. Don't lie to yourself. What was the firstly, first question about that? Because that's interesting. What, let me think, what is, what was the, the exact, moment you realized lying to yourself was having a a negative a, a markedly negative effect on you and particularly mental health I, I'd like to ask more questions about ENTJ mental health yeah yeah no excellent question there excellent question there let's see It's, it's less of an exact moment, and it's more like, um, so for, for me, I, I externalize my stress in my body. Like, I, I physically hold it rather than holding it mentally. Mm. And basically, although I wasn't increasing my physical activity, everything just started to hurt more and more. Like, my joints would hurt. I'd have muscle fatigue for no apparent reason. Um, and then I started to ask myself, okay, what's going on here? And then I was like, oh, I'm angry without a good cause 24 7. Hmm. So for other ENTJs, if, if you're forcing yourself into that role, what I think it's most likely going to, what would, would most likely occur is that your stress levels are going to increase and I can ignore my stress among the best of them in my estimation, hmm. but it's going to become a point in which you're going to start acting out. You're going to start procrastinating or you will just be in physical pain. The moment you start to notice yourself breaking your baseline of behavior is where you should start stopping and going, okay, what am I doing wrong? Maybe even ask someone else. Uh, if, if you have an inner circle built up, anyone who you talk with about your, or that knows you very well, just bring it up and be like, Hey, I think something's off. What do you think? How would you recommend ENTJ or what advice would you give to ENTJs about taking action once you notice something might be wrong one of the problems I've found with ENTJs is knowing there's a problem and refusing to do anything about it and I can't figure out why yeah no really good question there this unfortunately this may differ between individual ENTJs Hmm. And what I mean by that partially, let's see, a, a good way to break this down. Okay. So if you have an ENTJ and if they have refused or just have not acknowledged that they're acting off, or if they have noticed that something's wrong, like try, trying to bring that to their attention is going to be near impossible, I think. Um, hmm. You could just make a slight suggestive comment here and there and then let it marinate and say, hey, you know. 
Wait, did you cut out? No, no, no. I I stopped there because I'm trying to backtrack my thinking. Okay, okay. This is this is really difficult to try and dissect for someone. Um, okay, so I'll I'll just go at it this way. If you have an ENTJ who knows that they're doing something in their life or they're occupying some role that is not appropriate for them, they need to find some other role to occupy, even temporarily, even if it's not the optimal role for them, just so they can break out of that, what's basically not a role, it's not a piece of clothing anymore, it's becoming a mold. And that molding process is creating all types of havoc for them Hmm. because they're being forced into it, if that makes sense. Find some way to break out of it, occupy some other type of role, or just start looking at the things that they're doing. Anything that's changed, I would recommend looking over the past two years, roughly. Hmm. And... trying to figure out what feels appropriate for them, figure out the roles in their life that are, that fit well. And then trying to move away from that other role. It's, it's difficult because as I said, it'll depend on the ENTJ in question, whether it's a career type role, like professionally or, what their exact situation is. Mm. Additionally, I think this is just my gut feeling, but I think that a lot of the stressors for an ENTJ as it comes to the role they're acting out may be in their family relationships. Mm. Those relationships that they are not there because of choice necessarily. And they may be putting on uh, clothes or a mask or some kind of disguise around these individuals. And if they live with them, it may become very painful over time. Hmm. In that Mm -hmm. that situation, if possible, either removing the relationship, cutting off contact, editing it, or just allow people to see more of you that feels authentic and just be ready for the fallout. Hmm. I, I hope that answers your question in some capacity. It does. It does. Okay. Is, does the fallout or the potential for fallout keep you from doing things? Potentially. And what I mean by that is with very few exceptions, the extent to which I care about how people feel or perceive me is how it pertains to my long-term goals and objectives. So I, I for myself, outside of uh, my partner, romantically and one or two other individuals, my uncles, if they're feeling something, I can't feel it. So if, if I, Hmm. even people who are my friends, if they're feeling something, I can't feel it with them. If that makes sense. That being said, if I value those relationships for business or whatnot, then my concern about that fallout may be either that they won't leave me alone afterwards and they'll take up my time. Uh, Maybe I want something from that relationship. Like we have a relationship that is in some sense centered around work about getting something done. And I'm worried about that getting interrupted. Hmm. So it's the, the progression you're afraid or the, the, the potential of the progression you want being interrupted is the sort of fallout that bothers you most. Correct. Okay. Inter- that's interesting. Let me th- <laughs> let me think no. on that. Would you say or 
Are you good self company? Meaning, do you like talking with yourself and being with just yourself and feel satisfied with that? Sometimes. Sometimes I need external company. Um, I, I I would say it's... Um, it's partially difficult in that aspect because even just being around not necessarily other people, but at least for myself, I don't think this pertains maybe to other ENTJs, but even if I just um, go out into the wilderness and I'm by a body of water or I'm climbing up a mountain or something like that, or if I'm around my cats, Hmm suddenly this other thing that although it's not sentient and I'm not speaking with it, it gives me a sense of company. Hmm. That being said, I can, I'm usually fine just by myself. Uh, Sometimes I do need other people though. Hmm. What does, typically what does your self-talk or thinking look like? What do you spend most time thinking about let's see potential situations objectives that i have so it's like um i've I've got a mental model that i use to try and explain this to people it's not a very good one but imagine a rubik's cube that's about six to eight blocks wide and tall and it constantly is shifting in different directions Hmm. Imagine looking at that, but it's basically seeing potential um, courses of action in any given situation that may move forward into the future. Hmm. So I'm looking for a specific pattern that I'll basically hit a button on, and that's a course of action that I'll execute towards. So I've got different goals and objectives constantly being generated in my mind i retain a few of those uh for example uh, this past year i bought my first house it's a, a duplex property and during the course of looking for this house i basically had that mental model going of what are the factors that i need to find a property that meets my criteria and what are the steps in order needed in order to go and buy it and then own it? Hmm. I've constantly got stuff like that running through my head all the time. Interesting. That's. It's always interesting to hear how extroverted judging functions operate in people's heads. Because we get to see them at work in the world, but we don't get to see the way they work in people's minds. Do you ever get, or how quickly are you able to move on from a potential that maybe isn't working out? Really quickly. Hmm. Really quickly. So, basically, it's... It's harder for me to move away from a potential long-term goal because I see different avenues and those avenues are constantly shifting. That's the Rubik's Cube model. Mm. And I'm not very attached to any one avenue to get there because it is constantly shifting and I'm aware of it. I see it. I track it. So I'm not attached to the pathway specifically, but... I can be very attached to the goal. Do you ever get so attached to a goal, you get tunnel vision, and it starts affecting you negatively? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Going back to me buying uh, this house, during that process, 
there was a property before this one that I was looking at buying mm. and during that process, I was so focused on trying to make sure that the deal went through because there were a whole bunch of problems that just arose with it. Uh, they couldn't find comparables was what ended up eventually killing that deal. So they couldn't get the valuation on the property for my loan to go through. Mm. During that process, because there were problems arising with it, I focused on that and that alone. And then other areas of my life, other uh, work areas of my life primarily, but also to some extent relationships ended up falling to the wayside, at least temporarily. Um, partially, I've become more aware since then of my mental and emotional bandwidth, how much capacity I have to focus. Hmm. So it's it's a it's become something that I'm more conscious and aware of. I may still go ahead and give this one goal 90% of my attention for weeks on end, but I'm aware of that sacrifice and I'll try and let people around me know prior to me doing that, that that's what I'm going to do. So I'll say, hey, this is becoming a very difficult situation. I'm going to have to put almost all of my attention on it. So don't be surprised when that's all I talk about or that's all that I'm thinking about constantly is getting that goal achieved. Hmm. Do do these sorts of goals that you narrow in on, are there any, is there any significance in them besides just accomplishing something? As in buying this house, is was there something more to it than, yeah. oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there's usually several areas of significance in these goals. Hmm. That's one of the things that makes them so for lack of a better word, significant to me. Uh, case in point, prior, my grandfather mm. was not in the best of health over this past year. He is someone who got out of the Navy and he went into real estate, investing in real estate, working as a contractor. And we would constantly be discussing the real estate market, and how to make sound investment decisions in that aspect. Hmm. So this was a goal that I'd had for a while um, was to get into that uh, into that game. Not too seriously, as opposed to he or my uncle are. Hmm. But it became very important to me to buy my first property before he passed. Hmm it became very important for me to show him that side of myself to see budding signs of success in my life before he left this world. And I was able to achieve that partially because I narrowed down in this goal. So if, if there's multiple veins of significance like that, it makes it, it makes it even more compelling to focus in and to narrow in on it. Firstly, congratulations on that. That is neat, and I'm happy that you were able to accomplish that, and I hope he was happy and proud of you. <laughs> he grinned ear from ear. It was awesome. Very good. Very good. And the second thing... Thank you. Does... Well, FI, an introverted feeling, seems to have more of an effect on these sorts of goals than there might appear. Are yes, you, absolutely. Are you aware initially when you first get uh, get set onto a goal, its significance, or does it come over time? Do you realize what is significant about it? Partially, it comes over time. Hmm. Um, so for me, my method to try and identify what I'm feeling like internally mm. is that I will try and separate out 
different parts of myself. It's almost like I'm looking at my hand mm. or uh, how should I put it? Or trying to trying to identify what I'm feeling and especially in pertain in relationship to a goal. I'll go in that direction in a moment. Is like trying to feel out the features of your face rather than looking in a mirror. Hmm. There's not a lot of inherent sensory information there. It's very muted. Hmm. It's there. It's affecting me, but trying to identify it and articulate it is difficult. So I have to almost use my extroverted thinking about myself. If that makes sense. So in order to, so in order to do that, when it comes to a goal, I have to be in pursuit of that goal for a while in order to observe myself and to build up data points. Hmm. I, I hear introverted feeling can be frustrating, especially in the inferior for the person who has it. Does your emotional or has your emotional state ever, for reasons you do or don't know, prevented you from doing something or accomplishing something you really would have liked to have accomplished? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it'll, it'll even be small stuff, which is the weirdest thing. Hmm. There will be something that I've really wanted to do, and then. For one reason or another, something in relation to that will just make me frustrated and angry. Hmm. And even even for some of these specific examples, to this day, I can't articulate it. Partially because that time has passed and I can't build up any more data points regarding it. Hmm. Um, a, a recent example, uh, there, 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 was, there was a deal that I was looking at pursuing and I'm currently pursuing that deal. But during that process, we, myself and the other party had a meeting. Hmm. I had thought that we had hammered out the big issues for that deal to go forward. And then they sent over some paperwork to me without saying anything in regards to it. And it had, um, an objection that I had previously had turned away. So they surprised me with this. I'm, I know I'm being really vague. That's because it's ongoing. Hmm. But basically they had surprised me with something. And that was very much a betrayal. And because of that, I had told them that, that you know what? I'm done. I'm walking away from this. I'm not going to move forward on the deal. That should have been brought up earlier than this. I'm not doing business with you. Hmm. Uh, thankfully my partner, uh, talked some sense into me and we're still in discussions and we're looking to get that hammered out. Hmm. Is there any, is there any leeway in negotiations with yourself on these sorts of things? Can you, can, without, without forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do, can you convince yourself to feel better about it yeah yeah i can it i can if there's room to do so hmm. so going back to that situation there are multiple individuals on the other side of the table hmm. so for myself in order to move forward on that on this deal to try and move forward on it mentally i put all the blame on one individual in that party hmm this individual should have been the one to bring this factor to my attention and they didn't mm. because of that. I can say, you know what? I'm not going to hold it against these other individuals. They, sh they bear the responsibility for it. I'm still going to try and move forward mm. and not hold that against everyone else at the table. So basically if, if I have room, to self-talk, um, 
even if need be, assign blame onto someone or to assign, like, hey, look, this individual should have done this, but they didn't. Mm. If I can even self-talk myself into, you know what, it was an honest mistake, it happens. I've made a mistake like that, I can let that pass. Mm. Sometimes there's not. Or other times... Usually it's an act of betrayal. Hmm. That becomes very significant for me. If that occurs, all bets are off. I'm done. Hmm. Does FI... You mentioned it's like trying to feel your face instead of... Or without being able to see it. Does FI move... Does FI you did, did, let me think how does 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 your emotional state change abruptly without your knowing it? Yes. Do you have any idea what might cause that or is it something that you have you don't have access to? It's It's usually that I don't have access to it hmm. or I'm aware that my emotional state has changed, hmm. but I can't, there's, there's no detail to it if it makes sense. Hmm. So for myself, something can happen that will make me sad, let's say, mm -hmm. or something to that effect, or hurt. But because I don't have that level of detail, there's just, for lack of a better word, pain. And then that pain, well, I can't get bogged down in the moment because I have stuff that I have to do. So for me, it gets transmuted into something more approximating um, anger mm. or bitterness. So there'll be a sudden change and then it will burn into another direction over time until I have the capability to revisit it. That revisitation could be weeks or months later though. And that was going to be my next question. I'm glad you brought that up. Is that is it something you can you can f work through or fix when you're feeling that pain? Especially considering it is, it, I, it's one of the things I want to figure out for, yeah. for ENTJs because it, I've, go ahead. I've got, I've got the perfect direction to take that into mm -hmm. my method for working through stuff like that. I don't remember exactly where I stole the idea from. But effectively, rather than trying to very articulately identify and examine my emotional state, if I instead try and do some act of significance hmm. that matches it appropriately, that I think historically in society... We, we used to have uh, many ritualized things that would be done. Mm. And we see this across culture. I think that in our... Maybe this isn't the case, but I think that more currently in society, we place a greater emphasis upon talking about our emotions and verbalizing and articulating it as opposed to just on an animalistic level, feeling it, and then attaching some action to it. A good example that I could give, um, would be very much uh, uh, funerals. Hmm. So we have all this emotion 
around the loss of someone who is important to us. And attending and partaking in... It's one thing to be an individual at a funeral. It's another thing to be a pallbearer at a funeral. Hmm. trying to work your way through that emotional difficulty by doing something is is the closest i've managed to come that's that's fascinating because for me it those sorts of things mean to me mean nothing as in if i were at a funeral to me it wouldn't make any difference between attending or being a pallbearer how or do you have acts of significance are they ones you have developed for yourself or are you pulling certain ones from culture both both so my acts of significance that i have developed Basically, when I started to realize this about myself, I started to do research on that and trying to identify ritualistic practices, uh, Japanese tea ceremonies, um, performing a kenning. I, I, I think um, hmm. uh, during the process of uh, commenting on your channel, I think it was your channel, yeah, yeah um, I remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, effectively writing a piece of poetry or music and then performing it. This used to be an act of significance. I think it was from like medieval Europe that would be done uh, in relationship to losing someone. And we see this kind of thing attached to other large events in life. Hmm. Um uh, Lincoln's uh, the the like a presidential address, the Gettysburg Address, something to that effect. Um, trying to research historical examples of these acts of significance, extrapolating that information to then come up with my own that I can do. Hmm. And they once you've performed an act of significance, you do feel better. Yes, it's. Usually, it provides a sense of clarity. Even if I can't still articulate it, everything seems more clear. And I'm able to no longer be absorbed by that emotion. What does it look like? That's an interest. Clear is an interesting word. What does it, what does your mental state look like? when things are unclear? Imagine jumping off a waterfall and the force of the water flowing behind you is driving you underneath. Everything is dark, bubbly, and spinning. You don't know which way is up or down, left or right. You can't orient yourself, and you can't get a lay of the land. Hmm. And you're panicking. Hmm. Now, to be clear, though, there are various people who can jump off waterfalls. They train to do it. And then, like divers, for example they can operate in that environment because they learn how to be comfortable with it and to no longer panic. Hmm. So the longer I'm in that situation, either the more panicked I'll become or the more calm I'll become. And I'll just try and shut myself down emotionally or to separate my thinking processes from my emotional processes as much as possible so that way i can keep moving forward that leads into another question does that create 
emotional damage. Something you said I found interesting was ENTJs don't take emotional damage well. Potentially. I've, I've been thinking upon that because you had brought that up to me and to try and explain that, what that is. The prolonged, being in that state for a prolonged period of time, I think will cause not specifically emotional damage, but more of a damage to her overall, for lack of a better word psyche mental makeup hmm. um i, I t to use an example that i brought up before for myself i imagine that you're a glass bottle as an ENTJ, like a wine bottle or a beer bottle hmm. and are, are you familiar with the like a uh, weather phenomenon known as a fire twister no it's basically when a tornado catches on fire ah Okay. Yeah, so that's very hot, a lot of pressure, a lot of force behind it, and it can do an immense amount of damage. Take that whole thing and cram it into that bottle and stop it. Hmm. Now, emotional damage... So, backtracking myself, yes, being in that state for a prolonged period of time would create emotional damage. Effectively, anything that hurts us emotionally or creates long-term emotional pain in different forms is basically putting cracks into that bottle. Mm. At a certain point, that may break open. Um, and then at that point, you'd see the NTJ fall apart and just start acting like a lunatic, um, drinking, seeking meaningless short-term pleasure, um, having emotional outbursts, to that effect. Hmm. Yeah, and that, and so in in your in your example, the fire twister is the ENTJ or the emotional damage. That is the ENTJ. Okay. So, I think that we have, we're not very aware of it because we're outward looking, mm. but I think that we often have a lot going on emotionally. Mm. So, that fire twister is contained within that bottle, just barely, but it's contained, but we're looking outward from the bottle, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. How do you how do you stop yourself from breaking down once you're in that lunacy phase? And which is which is significant because for the viewers, if you don't know, if you've never seen it, lunacy is the right word. It's disturbing. It's like ENT once ENTJs are past that point it's like something cracks and they stop. I don't know how to explain it. Nothing makes sense. There's functioning no like really. people. Yeah. So I've had this happen to me in the past. So I'm I'm gonna do the um, difficult thing for an ENTJ, and I'm going to provide, for lack of a better word, vulnerability for a moment. Mm. Upon returning from the Marine Corps, I was working full-time at my local bank. I had managed to get in through some connections, and they knew I was decent at math. Mm. So they were willing to give me a shot, and I was doing fairly well there. Additionally, to my benefit, they would also cover college classes while I worked full time, hmm. saving me money. So I could take one or two per semester, and I started out with accounting 101 in a four week course during the summer. Hmm. Very content heavy, 
very fast paced. During this process, I was struggling at first quite a lot because I went from while being active in the Marines, I did we did we do learn stuff. We take courses all the time. But it's structured in a way that lets you download a lot of information very quickly mm-hmm. and retain it. Suddenly learning something through an online course that's going very fast paced and the topic at hand was very, I hadn't touched upon it in a long time. It was very stressful to try and do. Mm. Meanwhile, I was also having a difficult time adjusting to civilian culture and when I was taking a test on the computer that we had at home, I moved back in uh, with my mother. Hmm. She was on the phone with my aunt talking about wanting to have me medicated loudly while I was taking a test on a topic that was extremely difficult. Hmm. I promptly got up, left, and started just running. I had passed by a small park area and saw a wooden picnic table and I flipped it, smashing it into pieces and I started kicking it into bits. Hmm. Just running, trying to get away from people with what little sanity I left and destroying stuff that seemed destroyable in my way Hmm. to take my frustration out on. Eventually, I ended up behind some building just balled up, screaming nonsense and crying. Mm. Not a pretty picture. Very much lunacy. At some point, I had started humming a running cadence, managed to get up, and then properly jogged and sang a running cadence. So effectively, I, the, the cracks started to break, right? It didn't completely bu- bust open. Hmm. But I was able to find some anchor of my identity to try and claw my way back. Hmm. And then after that, I said about I said about moving the heck out and getting my own damn apartment. So, I am glad to hear that that did not <laughs> sink you because that is that is a terrifying place to be mentally. And how long? If you don't mind my asking, thank you for sharing that. If you don't mind my asking, how long did it take you to recover from that? Because that. That type of thing is rough. Fully or just to put the pieces back together? Fully. Let's go with fully. Eh. Nine months to a year. Hmm. Hmm. Partially, partially, I think in hindsight, it was a good thing that it happened. Because that is something that got me onto the pathway to be more, to examine myself more Mm. and to try and understand my own psychology and makeup more. Mm. I took to viewing myself and my mind as a tool and I recognized that it needed maintenance occasionally. Are you, now that you have processed that and learned more about yourself and re- reflect, are you in general happy as a human being? That's a really good question. I 
honestly don't really think about my happiness that much. I try not to be too attached to it. Like, I, I will... Okay, let me rephrase that. Since that's happened, I am more aware of when I'm happy. And I think I'm happy more frequently than I was before then. Hmm. It's not a pervasive sense of happiness. Like right now, I'm enjoying this conversation, so to a certain extent, I'm happy. But just overall, am I walking around a happy and jolly guy? No, that's not me. Hmm. And you, you work not to feel attached to your happiness. Is that a is that something you do naturally, or is that a choice, an effort? Um, let's see. I... No, I, I, I would say that um, I derive a lot of my happiness out of stuff that, view, that other people view as work. So sometimes that happiness is very momentary, but even when I'm not happy, I'm fulfilled and I have a sense of purpose. Hmm. I work to try and feel fulfilled, a sense of place and a sense of purpose Hmm. and a sense of I am doing what I meant to do, which I do get happiness from periodically. So if I close a deal or no, no, I don't get happiness when I close a deal or a contract or a sale. I drive happiness in pursuit of that thing when it's getting really close. Hmm. Um, did, did you ever uh, uh, go, have you ever gone fishing or caught bugs or anything like that? Even as a kid? Yeah. Okay. My sense of happiness comes when so I'm I'm an avid fisherman myself. Hmm. When I feel the line, line suddenly go taut, and I feel resistance on the other end, and I'm in the process of reeling it in, hmm. I'm extremely happy. Then, when I'm closing a sale, and the other party is engaged in the discussion and they're showing buying signals to me, I'm extremely happy. Then. Hmm. once I pull the fish out of the water or the sails through I'm still enjoying residual happiness but basically the ride's over at that point I'm looking for the next one Hmm. let me think about that do you do you feel or okay you meant you mentioned going after the next one. Do you feel or are you able how do you relax? I've heard ENTJs have a hard time relaxing. Are you able to relax? And if you can, <laughs> what sort of things do you do to relax and why do those things work? I go fishing or I go hiking. Hmm. Basically, I'm a very much a pursuit-minded person. Mm -hmm. The closest I can get to relaxing is pursuing something while having the need to achieve that goal be very low. Mm -hmm. I will go fishing in a body of water where I am damn sure there is not a fish in there, but I'm still going to go out and cast anyway. Hmm. And then occasionally I catch a fish and it's awesome or I'm irritated because now I have to take it off the hook and I wasn't, you know, prepared to do that. Hmm. Let me, let me think. So it probably does. It probably doesn't sound like a relax. Honestly, I I don't know if I do. Okay. Let me refer. Let me backtrack myself. Mm -hmm. I go until I get exhausted and then I pass out. Then rinse and repeat. Hmm. 
I got you. I got you. For in that, in terms of relaxing, or in terms of just life in general. Life in general, every day. If if I'm having a good day, I end it burnt out. Hmm. What? Okay. Moving moving toward the conclusion, what has MBTI as a system helped you accomplish? Oh, really good question. Really good question. Okay. MBTI is a system for my purposes of accomplishment I view other people, and many individuals will hear this and they'll take it absolutely the wrong way, Hmm. but I view other people oftentimes akin to tools. Hmm. And to be be clear about that fact, um, is, is is a jarhead with my rifle. I take care of that. I maintain it. I keep it in good working order. I care about it working. And functioning in that aspect and that's that carries over to people that I view as assets as well hmm. MBTI as a system has allowed me to identify that people think and operate in different ways and it gives me basically not quite a manual but an understanding of operating systems hmm. and how they work One, so now if I have an idea about even roughly what type through the MBTI system someone may be, I can identify goals and objectives that would be more well suited for this individual Hmm. so that I'm not asking them to do something that goes against how they think and operate. Hmm. One, so that way... I'm using this tool both more efficiently, but also I'm taking care of it and I'm not using it in a way that may potentially break it or hurt it. Hmm. For my own, for myself, uh, MBTI has allowed me to build more mental models about how I think and how I operate so that I'm aware of that so that I can use myself as a tool better so that I don't wear out as easy Hmm. and also that I'm less likely to break. Hmm. Again. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That is Uh, is one, one other question on that. So you mentioned, so people are a common misconception about ENTJs is that they are, heartless and careless with people but what you've just described is the exact opposite in fact it sounds like a it the vibe i get from what you just said and many of the videos on your channel is like a f e extroverted feeling done by t e is that something you Pretty do much. intentionally yeah what, I can't, I can't, I can't feel what other people are feeling, hmm. but I care about them because I need them. Hmm. So ra- rather than me being super empathetic and emotional with them and all this, as I put it, whimsy washy nonsense, hmm. I just try and take care of them so that way they can keep operating and they don't break on me. Hmm. Um, I, I think from your channel for ENTJs for myself certainly I've experienced this people often let us down and disappoint us hmm. in order to try and avoid that I try to take better care of my tools if that makes sense absolutely absolutely I um, think that's um, no I, I want to I keep going so for any ENTJ who may pick up on this. 
a key thing for you is to figure out what type of tool someone is and take care of them so they don't let you down. Hmm. Let me think about that a second. <laughs> okay, so final or no, let's see. Well, how, how about no final questions? Just keep the ball rolling. What do you mean? Or if, 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 you, if you have a, um, if you have, if I say something, that props a question, by no means let it stop. Well, as, 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 as far as I see INTPs, you guys are like rolling balls of ideas, turning into a giant Swiss army knife. Hmm. I'm not going to stop that progression. Well, the that's, that's funny. The issue with that is if... If one of us doesn't stop it, we're going to be here forever. <laughs> but, okay, okay. I'll, I'll cut you off at that case at some point. Definitely, definitely, okay. definitely. So for, the, for further viewers, if you are interested in seeing or hearing Samuel's thoughts, and especially his multifaceted use of extroverted thinking... His channel will be linked in the description, and I strongly recommend you go have a look. I wish there were more channels like his for every type, because you don't get clarity like that often. And I appreciate your time today, and I hope this helps, because starting a YouTube channel is slow and agonizing. It's pretty fun, honestly. And thank you, Skimmela. Thank you for having me on. Um, additionally, thank you for the content that you've put out there. It certainly helped me a lot, and it's helped me to further identify things that I was working on. Mm. Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. You have a... Wonderful evening. Thank you, Skimlet. You do the same. Bye -bye. Take care.